no deal. I'm Jaws on the beat, I got flow that kills. Do my thing with a few G's, Lauren Hill. What's up guys, it's Unders here and in today's video we're going to have a look at why you've got maybe warping, distorted or crackling audio in FL Studio and how we can fix it. And a big thanks to the channel sponsor DistroKid. DistroKid is a music distribution service and the best way to get your music out to all of the modern streaming services fast efficiently and within an independent artist's budget. Check out the description below for a discount today. There are a few different things that can cause it and they're mainly going to be down to settings of how FL Studio is running. I've set this demo project up here just so we're going to have an example of it and then I'll show you the things that we can look at that might cause it to happen and how we can fix it. If you like this demo project by the way you can in fact download that in the description below. So if I press play here the audio is going to be all kind of warped, distorting, popping and crackling. I don't think we need to hear any more of that. We can hear straight away it's not working and this might be the issue you've got and you can hear those little crackles continuing. Let me show you how to resolve that. If we go up here into the left hand top menu, we're gonna click on options. We want to go down to audio settings. I'm gonna click that and it's gonna bring up this little window for us. We'll just focus on this for the moment. Now, the first thing, if you're not hearing your audio in the correct place, you want to check this input output section and the little bit here where it says a device. Now at the moment mine's set to Capto Audio. That allows me to screen record and also capture the audio that's going on. But most of the time I'd have that set to my main audio interface. So if we open this up we can see that would be my Universal Audio Thunderbolt. That's my normal I.O. If you've got something like the Focusrite Scarlett, one of the most common audio interfaces, you'd want to make sure that is selected. So you just need to understand where your audio should be going and make sure that's highlighted. Now, a key thing with this, the majority of audio interfaces are going to be 44.1. And as you can see there, we've got this set to 44.1. You might have your audio interface or it might be set to work at something like 96 kilohertz, which would be this, for example. So you just need to make sure that's set correctly. But 99% of the time, 44.1 is where you're gonna to want to be. If we are working up at 90 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz, for example, um, you'll be using a lot more CPU and you're more likely to be running into these pops and clicks and issues that are occurring as well. So another way to do it is you can in fact change your audio interface to work at 44.1 if for whatever reason it's set to a much higher sample rate. So just below that, we've got something called buffer length. Now buffer length is the amount of time that your CPU, GPU and everything is given to process sound. If we want to play something in real time, say on a keyboard, one millisecond means the second we press that keyboard, there's one millisecond of delay. Something is imperceptible to us before we hear a sound. However, it means the computer's got to do a lot of work for that to happen. If we're just playing a simple piano sound, that's really easy for it to do. But in a case where it's going through all of these mixer channels at the bottom here, all of these various effects, master effects and then out to us, it's only got one millisecond to do all of that calculation for all of these channels and it begins to struggle. So we would want to set this buffer length. Now you can max it out and have it to a huge 93 millisecond here and that's going to cause a bit of a delay in when you look at where your playhead is and the sound you're hearing and if you're trying to play any instrument in real time you'll really struggle with that. What you need to find is a happy medium and these work a little bit like RAM. So if you think 8 milliseconds, 16, 24, 32, 64, etc. are good intervals to work in. I remember for this it worked relatively well at 1040 for this particular project we got no issues. And as you can see, that is a direct division there as well. It gives us exactly 24 milliseconds. Just below that, we've then got priority, okay? We can set that to normal, high, or highest. I find it works best on highest. And when you're playing the track back, you can see here the underruns. Underruns are what cause those little clicks. If you've got underruns of zero, you're gonna be in a good space. Putting on safe overloads can just help if you've got a really particularly busy section that it will just pump the CPU just for a little bit there and just give a safe overload in that kind of situation. But it can't continuously run a track like that. You can play around with the priority here. Um, I always give it highest where possible. I find that's working best. Now, the playback tracking, um, this depends whether or not your audio interface is going to be doing the tracking. You want FL Studio to do the tracking, or you can have a hybrid where they both work together. Uh, I found the mixer, the default, to be the best. Now, the offset, very, very simple. If your playhead up here 
is playing one sound but you're hearing maybe a sound a little bit further back or a little bit further ahead you use the offset just to ever so slightly adjust that and it shows you effectively a, a delayed or preemptive version of where it should be in the track based on your buffer length and everything there so we can keep it uh, perceptually working really well for us now cpu there's another super important one. I've got multi-threaded generated processing on and multi-threaded mixer processing on. So the machine I'm on here, quad core i7, it can make use of the multi-threaded processing. Essentially, a lot of the plugins here are multi-threaded supported. If we had this off, for example, so the multi-threaded mixer processing, it means that this mixer and all of the processes happening on it can only be done by one core. When a lot of the plugins on here are actually able to run off different cores, it makes a lot more sense to have multi-threaded switch on. Again, this depends on the plugin types you're using and the machine you've got as well. The last one here is one that can cause kind of some confusion. So it's mixer and it is resampling quality. This refers to if you've pitched up an adjusted sample, so I will do that quite a lot in tracks uh, take a kick drum for example and i'll pitch it to where i like now in the mixer side of things the 24 point sync is going to be fine 99 percent of the time we can push it above and beyond to the high quality it's going to use a lot of cpu and you'll start getting those pops and clicks back it's unlikely that you'll be able to actually hear a difference between the 24 point sync here and the even 128 point sync here unless your entire track is made out of heavily pitched and adjusted samples and if it, that is the case well, then you really need to render those parts out and then focus on them and when you render out you can in fact then render all the way up to the 512 point sync if you like but this is all done in real time so the 24 point is good enough i do find that something like the 16 or even the six point hermit are a little bit uh, too quick and too harsh if you're doing detailed mixing but for writing and getting a very quick response super useful for the most part leave it on 24 point sync and this one can be useful as well so the reset plugins on transport if you're pressing stop for example but a delay keeps going on for ages and ages and then when you press play again that delay is still playing switching on this reset plugins on transport when you press play the second time it will reset that delay plugin for example and it will no longer play again saving you cpu so hopefully, just with a couple of changes I've made there in the buffer length, and now when we play this back, it shouldn't pop and crackle. And that, guys, is very simply, is how you can resolve most of the popping and crackling issues inside the Studio. I hope this video has been helpful for you, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.